Hello and welcome to the Pacific Center Podcast. My name is Dr. Greg Lane and I will be your host as we explore many interesting topics with many amazing people from a variety of professional backgrounds over the months and years ahead. The focus of this podcast will be the intersection of the traditional healthcare practices of various cultures and the modern scientific research on peak physical and cognitive performance. The show will be delivered in an interview format. Our guest today is Jason Prawl. Jason Prawl is a former mechanical engineer turned entrepreneur, filmmaker, and health optimization practitioner. Due to 20 years of his own health challenges, Jason was given the opportunity to discover the reality behind his symptoms. Through this process, he began working remotely with individuals around the world to provide solutions for those suffering from complex health issues. In 2016, Jason transitioned from working in integrative disease care model to a model of health optimization and lifestyle medicine. In May of 2018, the lessons culminated in a documentary film series called The Human Longevity Project, which uncovers the complex mechanisms of chronic disease and aging and the true nature of longevity in our modern world. So Jason, welcome. It's so nice to have you here in our studios down in beautiful San Diego. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, it's going to dive right in. So your, your bio describes you as a longevity and health, uh, optimal health practitioner. Yeah. So uh, why don't you just share with us, what, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between um, not being sick or not having a disease and optimal health, yeah. right? So how many of us today can, can truthfully say that we are in a state of optimal health? Probably not many. And I think the reason that is is because of our lifestyle choices and the environment in which we live. And, and this really was the crux of, of the, the investigation um, for the Human Longevity Project, right? We wanted to go around to people that are living into their 90s and 100s in a healthy way mm -hmm. and really look at a lot of their lifestyle practices both today and 70 years ago and also the environments that they live in today and also 70 and 80 years ago. So, you know, I think, I think we have to m make a, a strong distinction between these two facts that not being sick is not the same mm -hmm. as being optimally healthy. Right. So the absence of disease is not, is not the uh, idea of health. Absolutely. And, and, and furthermore, optimizing health is really the, kind of the key word there that, that draws me in. It's like, what is really optimal health and, and wellness? I mean, health and wellness is such a, a catch-all yeah. term, I think, for the past, what, decade or 15 years, and we've kind of moved into this optimal or, you know, peak uh, experiences, peak performances. So. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we, we, we so often try to quantify things in the, in the disease model and also in the health world, and I don't know that optimal health can really even be quantified, right? I mean, if you look at lab markers, for example, you know, how can we really discern what is even optimal? Uh, right. Because optimal for you may be very different than optimal for me. Right. Um, our bodies are very different, our, our lifestyles are different, our age is different. All these things um, operate differently. So, so really, when we look at optimal health, I think we have to just, it's, it's almost a, a subjective question that we have to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. How do I feel? How do I, how do I you know, in, in my everyday world? And that could be how I'm thinking, how I'm feeling uh, emotionally, but also how I'm feeling physically. Am I sleeping well? You know, how are my relationships? How, how is my life? Am I happy, right? I mean, these are the things that I think that we have to look at when it comes to optimal health. So it's very subjective. It's almost an art form, you know, the, the art of living, so to speak, yeah. that we might hear uh, coming from the Eastern traditions, right? So um, there, are, there are ways we can quantify sort of disease to some degree, but I don't know that we can fully quantify health. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a, a very subjective matter that we have to look at introspectively. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you actually working with, with clients? Are you, you coaching people, so to speak, on, on optimizing health? Yeah, I, I have a, a few clients left, but um, really I've, I've, wa I've been moving out of the practitioner space into one of the health education space. So, yeah. you know, I, I did have a number of clients previously, but I'm okay. sort of dwindling down and, yeah. and cutting out those services and really focusing on, um, you know, the philosophy of health, the, the um, ideas that are around health and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and how I can reach as many people with those concepts as possible. And that's really where I want to live. Because at the end of the day, living healthy is not um, 
it's not a, a something that you can put on paper and say, here's what you do, X, you know, X, Y, Z. It's not right. that at all. Right. Um, it's really an idea. How can we give people an understanding, a, a global perspective of, of how they can approach their life? And that's really what they have to take into their own life, right? You, it's almost teaching a, a person to fish as opposed to, um, you know, giving them a fish. Right. Right, and I really appreciate what you said. You've, you've sort of transitioned from working in that one-on-one -on -one coaching, if you will, with an individual to this broader, um, I, I think, mission, if, if I might yeah. be so bold of yours, is to really educate. And with your Human Longevity Project, wow, I mean, what an undertaking to, to have done that. And um, so how did, how did you get interested in you know, moving from optimization of health and, longev and moving into longevity? I guess there are sort of inextricably bound, but yeah. how did you get interested in, in the concept of longevity? What, what came first for you? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, with, with my health challenges, right, and they were, I had knee pain at 13 years old that was chronic, that stayed with me for 20 plus years. I had, you know, seborrheic dermatitis, which is, you know, a skin condition um, on, the, on my face when I was in my 20s. So these are the things that prompted me into self-discovery, you know, the discovery of, of how I can be healthy. Because everything that the doctors were giving me you know, the solutions that they had were not sufficient. You know, they didn't really do the job. Yeah. And so, you know, this is back in the early 2000s, right? I mean, so the internet was just starting to kind of come into its own. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but nevertheless, that was my opportunity to, to discover really what was underneath these things, right? And so it was a, a long path in, in sort of peeling back layer after layer after layer, because there's a lot there. Sure. It's the things I was eating. It's the things that I was using in, my, in, in the household products. It was... Um, you know, the way I was sleeping, the way, all my behavior, right, mm -hmm. that was involved. Not to mention, you know, things like emotional trauma and, and childhood developmental trauma um, that I had to uncover, right? these patterns, these behavioral patterns that we developed that become sort of our personality. Yeah. I had to sort of peel those layers back. So, and, and then you can even go deeper, right, I mean, in, into sort of the subtle body. I mean, there's lots of, of layers here that we can get into, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, I kept peeling back and understanding more and more of this. And as I did that, um, you know, I, I worked in sort of the integrative functional medicine model for a while, and, mm -hmm. and this was running lab work, um, functional lab work, and that was great, and it was it was useful to some degree. Mm -hmm. But part of that process was really it maintained the disease outlook, right? It was, it was right. really trying to to label a disease or label a, a dysfunction, and then address the dysfunction or disease. Mm -hmm. And you know, even though we were trying to do it in a functional way, it was still looking at disease. Right. So the thing that I recognized in that process was, wow, we're missing this whole component of how do we teach people to be healthy? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be healthy how, in terms of lifestyle? And the, the reality that I, that I sort of self-identified was if you have health, then disease can't exist, mm -hmm. right? So why don't, it's like shining a light. If the light's there, then there is no darkness. Mm -hmm. so, so why don't we focus on that mm -hmm. as opposed to try to dissect and analyze and and get into the weeds with disease, mm -hmm. let's teach people to be healthy and trust that the body has the mechanisms, the body and the mind, mm -hmm. have the mechanisms to restore balance, to, to become healthy again, mm -hmm. if we eliminate the blocking factors and some of these things that are throwing us out of balance. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I sort of started to, to, to place my consciousness, if you will, mm -hmm. when it came to clients. And then, you know, from there it was a matter of, of saying, okay, well, there's sort of these universal concepts that we have. Why would I spend you know, my time regurgitating the same thing to each client, which is we've got to focus on sleep, we've got to get to emotional trauma, we've got to change the way we, we look at uh, diet and behavior and all these things. Why would I keep going over the same stuff one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. when I can just reach a, a large swath of people with the same message? And that's really where, I, you know, that's how the sort of human longevity project and the idea was born, mm -hmm. was, was as, a, as a way to reach more people. And we just use, honestly, we just use longevity as a as a, a lens through which to to look at a lot of this stuff. So, yeah. you know, and I think what better way than to go around the world and speak with somebody that's 105, right. still riding a bike, right. has his has his wits about him, uh, you know, is in relatively good physical shape, mm -hmm. and, and and hear his story, mm -hmm. right? And so when you hear somebody like that tell you what they think health is and where it comes from and how to live, mm -hmm. and then you hear something from uh, you know and uh, you know integrative oncologist or functional medicine doctor at the Cleveland Clinic or, you know, a Chinese medicine expert or whatever, and, and you hear the same things that based in sort of research and modern understanding and, and something that's through experience, yeah. then it starts to really hit home. And so that's, that's really what we did. 
So in the and how long is how long is the um, longevity project? It's yeah. it's nine episodes, yeah. um, and and really the each episode is sort of trying to focus on a different area of, of health or yeah. well being. Yeah. So disclaimer: I haven't watched all of them. I it's watched, a lot. It's a lot. I don't know that I've honestly actually watched but, all of them after they were finished. Yeah, I just want to say that the quality is amazing. The quality is excellent, and the people you. that you that you interview are incredible. And it's the production value is amazing, and so for our listeners who haven't uh, haven't seen it or um, or aren't aware of it, they must. It's a must to see. Thank it really you. Really, is not to be missed. And it's humanlongevityproject.com. Right? Exactly. It's a, you, the film is called the Human Longevity Project. Yeah. The, you can find it at humanlongevityfilm.com. Humanlongevityfilm.com yep. for yep. our and, listeners. And it's it's to be honest, it's a lot of content. So yeah. there's yeah. there's you know it's somewhat entertaining, uh, mm -hmm. but I will say this is very it's educational. A, it's very info packed, yeah. you know, and so that was because of that we wanted to make sure that it was high quality, so that it was somewhat entertaining to watch. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And so some of the people that you had on there, um, Dr. Kalish. Um, well, maybe would you yeah, name, just I mean, name some of the people and some of the yeah. disciplines that are included? In yeah, that? Dr. Dan Kalish, uh, Paul Check was involved. We had Datis Karazian, who is um, probably one of the the best. You know, immunologists um, out there, Dr. Uh, Aristo Boshdani. Um, we had Deanna Minnick, who is a fantastic um, personality in sort of the functional medicine world. Um, we had Dr. Jeffrey Bland mm -hmm. involved. Um, we have people like J.P. Sears, who may be known for more of his comedy, right. um, but who's got a tremendous amount of wisdom in the emotional intelligence, emotional health mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have uh, we, we have some. Um, not doula, but uh, midwives, midwives mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. So you know, we, we looked at birth even, right, and how, how that impacts things. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at emotional health. We look at um, you know connection and community. We have mm -hmm. Dr. Mark Hyman is involved. Um, ben Greenfield. We've got people from all kinds of disciplines. You know, right. from the physical health to the mental health to emotional health to childbirthing to circadian rhythm function and how the body functions on cycles. Environmental toxins experts like like Laura Adler, uh, Dr. Jolene Brighton, who's really a, an expert in the female mm -hmm. um, health and, and reproduction. I mean, you name it, Emily Fletcher on meditation. I mean, you know, there's so many components of health mm -hmm. um, that we've got people in metabolomics. I mean, Dr. Um, Tsoukalis from, from Greece um, talking about metabolomics. So we, we've got people from darn near every spectrum here trying to contribute their, their understanding um, that really comes back to lifestyle, and yeah. so it's it's funny because so much science is needed yeah. to explain such basic lifestyle practices. Yeah. But that's where we're at, and that's sort of the way we think in the, in the West these days. So, I was talking to um, our producer uh, Todd Luger over lunch, and we were talking about you know preparing for this and just thinking about longevity, and um, and and we were we were both reflecting on. Uh, f faith, if you will, mm, and yeah. not, not necessarily, you know, if you're religious or not, but faith in something. Yeah. What What did you find in, in terms of, you know, your uh, explorations with regard to lo um, longevity and, and faith? Yeah, I, I think it's funny. You know, there's there's been work that, that's been done on this topic, right? Longevity and trying to find the the common factors, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and some things have been um, espoused, like community, right, and um, and. Uh, some connection to a higher power or whatever, whatever that might be. I, I really actually don't think it's either of those two things. I think I think really what it is, it's not a matter of being religious or having connection to something greater. I actually think it's it's connection, period. Connection. So it's yeah. it's having connection. Right? Mm -hmm. Humans, we need connection, whether that's to another human, whether that's to a pet, mm -hmm. whether that's to the earth, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's to a concept of God, right, mm -hmm. or, or universal, however you might frame that. Mm -hmm. Um, I really think that's what it is. I think we need connection. And so what we found, whether it was in Okinawa or, you know, in Sardinia or in Greece or in Costa Rica or in the U.S., mm -hmm. it's really connection that, that is a key factor that is important for health, for long-term health. And I think really what it comes down to in sim simple biological terms is, you know, really from a nervous system standpoint, mm -hmm. right? right? We feel relaxed. We feel, we feel like we're taken care of. We right. feel like that we can rely on something else. Yeah. Um, and we feel like there's there's some um, love, some connection of love between, like I said, whether it's a pet or whether it's the earth. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think it's it's connection, and that's and you can see that we're we're missing that here in the U.S. in particular and in the West. So much of our society is missing connection. I think we have more community than ever. 
I can sure. go online and find community in a heartbeat. Right. I've got community in my apartment complex. Yeah. I've got tons of community. Yeah. What I lack is the ability to connect with people around similar topics and, and to really find that heartfelt connection. So, you know, this is where we, we brought in things like, um, you know, um, the people at HeartMath to, oh, to right. look at this stuff, right? Yeah. So it's sort of this heart-brain coherence. And, mm -hmm. and so there's deep science, I think, in a lot of this. But at the end of the day, it's very simple. I think it, it really is this, this idea of connection to something mm -hmm. uh, other than ourselves. I've had first-hand experience with a uh, patient uh, that I was treating with acupuncture. Um, long story short, very very troubled. You know, lived in a in a house with an estranged partner. They lived behind closed doors. They they never spoke, mm. but there was this, always this anger. And she turned to heart math, and she had her device with her when she came in. She would get treatments, and you, I could see her just drop down in this beautiful sense of calm and like you're saying connection, w w without me doing anything. Right. She just had this heart math. You know, no acupuncture, no herbs, nothing. And uh, so, absolutely. And it's, something like that's really great. This is where something like meditation can really come into play, right? And in the places we went, meditation was not a thing that people did. Mm -hmm. um, even exercise was not a thing people did. So, you know, this leisurely exercise, yeah. um, they exercise as part of their work, as part of their life, you know. In fact, they're, that's basically what they did all day long was move in, in some way or uh, some way. So, it wasn't a matter of, of exercising is good. Yeah. It was like they were always moving. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't meditate. Um, none of the cultures we visited meditated. That's not to say that meditation isn't good. In fact, it's probably more of an argument that we need to bring in meditation into our world because it's so chaotic, yeah. so overstimulating. That something like meditation can help calm the nervous system down mm -hmm. and reconnect us with ourselves in something greater than us, which which can, can come through a felt experience. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really a, sort of a sort of psycho-spiritual state mm -hmm. that, we're, that we are finding when we have these connection points to something else. Did you, did you happen to go to, there's a place in Italy, I think, that has the greatest uh, concentration of centenarians? Do you, are you familiar yeah, with so the, the, the original work was done by Michel Poulin, who okay. is a demographer out of Belgium, okay. and he, he identified this, this region in the mountains of Sardinia, right? Okay, so, so Sardinia, sort of Sardinia Italy, mm -hmm. and, and you know, don't tell some Sardinians that, that it's part of Italy. There's still <laughs> this sort of sense of, of, of separation, but, okay. but you know, this is a very interesting place um, in these mountains and these sort of villages. Well, what's Sardinia. going on there? And that's just it, right? Everybody's trying to, been figure, trying to figure this out for the longest time. And I think there's a lot to, to really look at if we want to speak in terms of science and understanding longevity. First of all, I think a lot of the longevity hotspots are isolated. This is why you see so many islands, right? So you have Okinawa, which is an island. You have Sardinia, which is an island. You have uh, the parts of Costa Rica, which is sort of, it's not an island, but it's sort of on its own in a, in a peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Greece, you know, the, the Icaria, which is an island in Greece, is an island. And so why would that be? And, and sort of my hypothesis is that really what determines longevity are two primary biological factors, let's say. One is the, um, the continuity of the genetic code, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is our human genome, but it's also mitochondrial genes, and it's also the microbiota, right, that, that we have. So if you, if you, can, you can imagine that just from an evolutionary biology you know, way of thinking, from that lens, then the, the genetic code gets optimized for that environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not a matter of good genes or bad genes or any of that. It's just, it's, op it's optimization, right? It's, it's the adaptive nature of the genetic code for a given area. Okay. And so if you have somewhere that's isolated, mm -hmm. then over time, it's probably going to become pretty well adapted to, to that area. The other thing that comes with that, though, I think is culture. Mm -hmm. And so if, and, and by the way, Sardinia, um, according to a archaeologist that I, that I spoke with in Sardinia, mentioned to me that, that their genetics were some of the oldest in Europe, that, mm -hmm. they, that was preserved better than, than most because when the Romans came and, and uh, tried to conquer Sardinia, they actually got pushed back. Mm -hmm. So the Sardinians sort of held them off and they're sort of notorious for being sort of warriors in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people stayed there and so you didn't have this sort of you know, mixing, if you will, genetically speaking, mm -hmm. with the rest of Europe. And so they kind of maintained a really strong genetic code. The other part is, is the culture. Can the culture be maintained? Mm -hmm. And and what what is culture? Right? If we if we really think about it, especially pre-industrial revolution, the culture is really a way of, of it's a sort of an operating system mm -hmm. for the society, right? How can we how can we operate uh, given our environment and, and and what's been passed down through time? Yeah. And so it's really just an operating system and, and there's a lot of great operating systems, which is why 
um, you can have these cultures around the world that do very different things, eat very different things, behave very different ways, and can still live a, a meaningful life and that, that is really healthy into their old age. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's really what was preserved, is, is the optimal way of living in, that, in the context of their environment. So whether it was in the mountains or whether it was, you know, at sea level. Yeah. There's, there's very different ways that we can think about that. And so that's really what was preserved. And I think what we're seeing now is, is and this is all fascinating, because right now is a very unique point in history where, where we're seeing these culminations of these sort of centenarian groups. Uh, because the, as the Industrial Revolution took hold over much of the world, most of, much of the Western world, we're starting to see, um, first of all, in order to sort of classify groups of centenarians as, as being something special or, or, or uh, concentrated, it has to be birth records. Yeah. Right? So, so you right. can imagine 200 years ago, or even right now in the jungle or where, where, what have you, a lot of these don't have birth records, sure. so they might be, have a lot of centenarians at a, at a high percent, but we wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So you have to have sort of this, it's more of this weird point in history where we can go back far enough and, and track birth records mm -hmm. relatively okay, but also has to be sort of secluded or, or, or um, uh, the, the modern Western way of life, this industrial way of life, has not penetrated that, that culture. Right. So it's sort of this weird mix of can we go back far enough and get records, but also can we insulate it from, from the, this new modern way of living, which we know brings chemicals and all kinds of different things that are not conducive to living a long, healthy life. Mm -hmm. And so there's only a few places around the world that, that we could say that that's the case. Yeah. And so as we go forward, this is, the, this is the conundrum that we're finding. The records are, of course, as for 100 year olds are going to improve, right? I mean, this is, this is the way forward, we're, we're going to have better records. Mm -hmm. but, but also, we're now seeing more penetration of this Western way of life. So if you take place like Okinawa, the records are, are getting better and better if you look at 100 year olds, right? Because you can, they start to filter into the, what, 1918, right? So right. that's a 100 year old now. Um, but we're also seeing McDonald's and mm -hmm. Starbucks mm -hmm. and more cars mm -hmm. and, you know, this, this mixing of genetics and, you know, which, this is not a bad thing overall. I'm just suggesting that all of this may not be conducive to longevity of the region. Mm -hmm. And you have people leaving the region. Right. You have people coming in. So it's, it's almost impossible now from a you know, demographic standpoint to really find a place that's going to have this. So, right? so, yeah. so, and this is what we're seeing. Okinawa is now the, the life uh, expectancy is, is dwindling. You know, they're not as healthy as they once were. So both the, the, the life expectancy and the health is declining in, in these areas. Mm -hmm. So they may not be so special anymore, and we're starting to see that. So, yeah. so again, I can, I can imagine a case that in 20 years, none of these places are going to be known for their longevity, mm -hmm. you know, because, yeah. because the younger generations have been moving around, and, and you have all these, these new Western ways of life coming in. You have tourism. You have, so, you know, I, I think we're a really unique inflection point mm -hmm. in this in this historical context that we may not find this um, and or it may just move to somewhere else that we find that they have records and that the, the western way of life hasn't penetrated too much and so they've been insulated mm -hmm. um, from some of these modern challenges that we're, we're seeing now that's a unique scenario the what the u.s and some of the sort of more pronounced western cultures and now i think are emerging out of the downsides of, of modernization and we're now using that same sword to, to wield a new era in, in, in longevity. Mm -hmm. So we can now use this modern way of life to bolster our health and bolster our longevity. Right. Right? It's biohacking and exactly. and optimization. And of of right. all kinds of things. I mean, yeah. we are going to get into the wildest of wild technologies that can yeah. help us live healthier lives. Yeah, I mean, we're monitoring every step we take with our Absolutely. And some of this devices. is going to be detrimental and some of it's going to be helpful. I think that the tools that we can use to track, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like, uh, you know, sleep trackers, mm -hmm. that's, that's very useful. Um, you know, some of these other things, uh, you know, Fitbits, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I notice you're not behind? wearing a Fitbit, by the way. No, you're I think... You're wearing traditional prayer beads. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think, I think, to be honest, some of this technology can actually do more harm than good. Yeah. Um, I think the real key is, can it, can it get us to change behavior? And can we track, um, you know, something meaningful, like, like sleep quality? Probably mm -hmm. the most meaningful thing we can track, yeah. really. Um, is sleep quality. So, so it's, it's, we're at this weird time now where I think a lot of the technology that was harming us in the past um, is now going to be, is now moving into a new era that, that we're using it to, to help us uh, live healthier lives. Do you think we're, we're at a, I mean, we're both in this milieu, so we, we see it, we live and breathe it every day, but I don't, 
I don't think we've hit a tipping point in terms of our culture. Do you? No. I mean, I, I, no. I think we're pretty far from it. I mean, especially with the, when you think about political dynamics and uh, social dynamics and geographical dynamics of even just our own country. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're really near a tipping point. No, I think I think it's such a. I think we're we're always moving and creeping and. Um, it's so dynamic yeah. that that I think it's always sort of emerging and new, yeah. um, and and I think I don't think anything I don't have any dire forecasts for the for the U.S. Uh, in terms of health. I think we have some big issues. I think you know the new technology like 5G and some of the the Wi-Fi and, and electromagnetic issues that mm -hmm. we're we're starting to see. I think that's a big thing to look out for. Mm -hmm. um, I think people re will reject it before it gets too too detrimental. Um, you know, it's really the things that are under the surface that are sort of sneaky that that, that we need to really look at. You know, um, things like indoor lighting, right? Yeah. I mean, it's so so sneaky and so small that we would think it's not really that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. And 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 the lighting itself is not really that bad. But if you think about the way we live indoors mm -hmm. most of the time in yeah. front of computers, sitting. We, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're not we're not getting outside into natural light. Now, why does that matter? Natural light, you know, has frequencies that indoor lighting does not have. It has more of a, a, of a power, I guess you could say, yeah. um, of some of these frequencies. Yeah. And those frequencies of light are very, very tuned to our biology. Yeah. We've been, you know, tuned to that for thousands and thousands of since we've been on this planet, right? So, and every, every biological organism is, you know, I mean, there's very few organisms that don't um, have some component that is, that is guided by light. And so, we, we really rely on that to guide our biological processes. And once we remove ourselves from that natural environment, we're now opening ourselves up to to to, to operating that, that is not familiar, and so you know there's some of these things that I think we have to become more aware of. But we are. I mean, this is what the science is showing. Even 2017 was the Nobel Prize was given to um, somebody that's looking at circadian biology, right? This idea of light and how it affects our biology. Mm -hmm. So you know, those are the things that I think we have to really pay attention to. And and this is simple stuff. You know, that in fact, we don't have to even get lost in the science. Yeah. We just have to accept the fact that we probably should be going back to a more natural way of living as much as we can, mm -hmm. knowing that we're going to continue this technological advancement and, and it's going to continue to be a part of our lives, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. The question is, how can, we, how can we bring forth some of the old ways of living while also incorporating some of the new things that, in an intelligent way? So it's, it's really about being, having that discernment mm -hmm. with the, the technology as it comes out, not just accepting all this new stuff, thinking that it's technology, so it's, it's always good and it's always fun. It can be detrimental. Yeah. What's your take on, on supplements for longevity? I think supplements are great. Um, I think supplements are fantastic. Now, that comes with a huge caveat, which is that how do you know what to take, when to take it, yeah. how much to take, yeah. and when to stop? Yeah. The body's so dynamic. I think, the, I think we have to start with the philosophy that the body is is perfectly designed to deal with with health, mm -hmm. right? To, to, to give us health. It, it's what it does. It is a dynamic organism that, that is that's going to respond to environmental factors the way you think, the way you the way you emote, the way you behave. So if we if we understand that the body is perfectly designed, then that's a great place to start. In other words, it's not lacking anything, it doesn't need something that it doesn't already have. It's it's really about how do we tune that to, to get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, given our chaotic environment, yes, we can use tools, whether it be acupuncture or light therapy or you know uh, nutrients and supplements and hormone replacement and, and there's all kinds of tools that we can use. Chiropractic adjustment, mm -hmm. cranial sacral therapy, I mean there's just, it goes on and on. Right. These things are very, very beneficial and I include supplements in that same category. The question is, is you just have to know when, when to take, what to take, and how much to take, and yeah. when to stop. I think that is the key. Given the fact that our soils are fairly depleted, and that we're getting food that's not optimally grown, mm -hmm. I think we are missing some of the, I don't even want to say vitamins and nutrients, because I think it goes way beyond that. I think it, it has to yeah, do with the magic of life. Magic. Yeah, you know, the things that we can't quantify, right? Because right. you can grow an organic apple, cut it into slices, and create apple chips out of it. Mm -hmm put it in a bag and sell that. And that's very different than eating an apple off the tree itself. Right. So there's just a lot, so lot of things no there. chi in the chips. Exactly. Yeah. Let's just yeah. say it like it is. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs>
So I think there's just things that, w that we're missing mm -hmm. um, and that come down to biological life not being sort of really respected with the, with the food. So, you know, some of these things like um, probiotics, really high quality. Yeah. I prefer spore-based probiotics, um, but even prebiotic foods and, and, and supplements. And So, yeah, there's, there's things we can do. Again, it's really hard for most people to determine what to take and when to take. So, so I don't like to start there. I don't think that's a good place to start if you're dealing with, you know, suboptimal health or disease or, or dysfunction. I don't think it's it's the best to reach for supplements. If you have a really good practitioner you're working with that knows how to use those in in, in an intelligent way, I think that's really the idea. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is where you know, increasing, you know, yin and decreasing yang and, you know, all these sort of Chinese medicine, I think, philosophies are really a great place to start when it comes to supplements. I, I think the Chinese medicine philosophy is probably the, the most advanced that I've seen when it comes to supplements and, and herbs and tinctures and these type of things. Mm. I think the Western philosophy is, is off the mark quite a bit. Um, it's hard to, it's hard, yeah, I mean, the, the strength of Chinese medicine is that we deal in, in systems. broad systems, yeah, and, exactly. and it's really hard to navigate down to the, you know, the microcellular cellular level to get that level of balance that yeah. it, a person might need. So I was just wondering well, about and, and I think this is the problem, too, is that as technology has, has become more advanced, we're looking deeper and deeper, right, which, mm -hmm. which gets us a more narrow and narrower viewpoint. So literally, we're, we're, we're missing the forest through the trees the deeper right. we go. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, target something inside the mitochondria. It's like, yeah. well, okay, great. But what about the big picture? Yeah. What about the, the cell, cell as a whole? What about the extracellular matrix? What about yeah. the system? What about, I mean, we're just missing all of that. So I, I totally agree. I think Chinese medicine has the philosophy of looking at systems. And that's the best approach, in my opinion. So um, what's... We've talked a bit. Is there anything more that you want to share about the longevity project that we haven't talked about? I mean, I, there's I, so much. I would yeah. bet, but I mean, there's there's nine episodes worth of yeah. this stuff, so we can go. So I really want to get into your next project, which is mm. really intriguing to me because of my personal interest in yeah, traditional yeah. medicine. So your next project is really exploring traditional medicines around the globe. Absolutely, and I'm fascinated, obviously, with with this next project, and I think we may be working with you on certain things. Yeah, I hope forward. so. I know you you guys have a lot of resources that can yeah. help us to, to sort of flush some of this out. So what's the, what's the next step? What's it called, first of all? <sighs> Good question. If anybody really has any ideas. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we, we have a really poor working title. Oh, yeah. But we're, we're actually in the phase of mapping it out and, and executing on some of, of the filming. But the idea is to go around to uh, traditional cultures around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that be the North American natives, South American natives, you know, the shamans in West Africa, the Ayurvedic and, and yogic practitioners, uh, the practitioners in places like Bali or Tibet and Chinese medicine and, you know, the aborigines of Africa or of, of Australia, these type of things. Mm -hmm. And really explore each culture and bring forth the essence of their, of their healing mind, body, spirit, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what practices they be, do they use to heal the mind, body, spirit? And what's the philosophy behind it? You know, where did these, these practices come from? I mean, if you look at some of these shamanic ways of healing they use things like egg healing and it's yeah. like it's fascinating to think that they can do this stuff mm -hmm. but this is um you might call it folk wisdom right it's 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 using it's it's using practices that have developed over many many generations and they're successful be, and you know this because they're continuously being used if, if they if they weren't successful they would have gotten rid of them a long time ago yeah. so there's all kinds of different practices that they that they use and our our idea is just to really go into these cultures and, and explore them firsthand, mm -hmm. um, and and try to f try to bring forth the essence of really what's behind some of their teachings. So it's it's, it's not you know I mean we can look at Chinese medicine it's like it's so insanely complicated. I mean you can study this stuff for you know decades and generations. Life. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. It's so and so in depth. Yeah. And so the goal is not to try to explain the nuance of all this stuff, but mm -hmm. really bring forth the the general essence. Right? Why do they think the way that they do? What are some of the practices that they use, and and what are they healing? Mm -hmm. You know, when we when we talk about chi and something, what are we talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And so, we want to get to those cultures and really get get their understanding and, and their description of what what's going on, at the various levels. Because you know, I, I've talked talked to enough shamans, and mm -hmm. they speak in different language. And yeah. I don't mean well, they can speak in English, yeah, yeah. but they speak a completely different language about the way what they're healing and why they're healing it, yeah. and what the real problem is, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think a lot of this stuff is really fascinating when you get to this different level of, of thinking and mm -hmm. how it can be applied. Because what we think of as autoimmune disease may be a completely different, 
you know, line of thinking in, in some of these, these traditions and these cultures. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, what we say in the West, and this is, I think, hopefully this viewpoint is starting to, to go away, but the body attacking itself. I mean, that's right. not only a ridiculous notion that the body would ever attack itself, um, but, but I think we're missing the bigger picture, even on the biological level. You know, we just stick, stick to, to biology as if this is a mechanical thing that's happening right. in the body, and it's like, no, we know that there's emotional traumas that are involved, we know that there's psycho-spiritual issues, there's maybe past life stuff according to some cultures and traditions, there is, um, you know, inherited traumas that can, that can affect us, even Western science is acknowledging this now. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just more to it, you know, yeah. when we talk about spirit and soul and mm -hmm. energy and subtle bodies yeah. and etheric bodies, yeah. I mean, there's just all these cool things that, and our goal is not to um, say this is how it is. Mm -hmm. The goal really is to explore these different ways of thinking and operating and see what emerges on the, on the outside of that. But also to bring in, bring it forth to modern science, right? Yeah. Um, you know, shamanic drumming and, and, and African dance. And mm -hmm. We know that drumming can now put the brain into a different conscious state Absolutely. That, that may infer benefits, yeah. right? So, so there's a lot of this stuff that we now are understanding in modern science that you know, these people have been doing for, for generations. So we need to maybe explore some of those ancient ways of, of thinking and operating and see how we can, we can bring those forth into our new Western paradigms. Absolutely. That sounds fascinating. And so um, are you aware that, that the uh, World Health Organization is coming out soon, probably within the next year or two, with their new ICD-11? No. Which is a tech, so. Uh, I don't even know what you just said. So ICD <laughs> stands for Internal Classification of Disease. Okay. So I, we're on ICD-10 right now. Before that was ICD-9, etc. So ICD-11 will actually include traditional medicine. Ah, so well. our, our terms like spleen chi deficiency will actually show up in the ICD-11. And so practitioners can code that so that they can submit that bill to get reimbursed by insurance companies. So, I love it. So this is all happening as you're exploring, you know, traditional medicines too, the World Health Organization has identified, and I don't know which, which ones, probably like for sure Chinese medicine and, and um, Ayurveda, beyond that I don't know which right. traditional ones, some of them are obviously more popular. Yeah, and ingrained in our, yeah, so. and, and I think, you know, there's, there's really a lot happening, I think, that, that I see in medicine is that, and we could even come back to the archetypes, right, mm -hmm. these sort of the masculine, logical, um, left brain sort of frameworks have been dominating for so long yeah. in the West, and now what we're seeing is sort of the feminine, the mm -hmm. the heart center, the that started to emerge, right? And, and it, what's funny about all this is that if you actually go back to some of the um, the prophecies from from some of these ancient cultures in South America, the shamans and, and the wisdom keepers of these ancient cultures, you know, they talk about the the eagle and the condor, okay. and this this idea is that. Um, this is supposedly brought forth thousands of years ago, this prophecy that, that said that the, the, the eagle, which represents the masculine, the uh, logic, the scientific you know, viewpoint, the West, basically that, the Western framework, is going to become so powerful and so dominant that it was almost wipe out the condor, mm -hmm. which is the feminine, the heart, mm -hmm. the, the indigenous, the, the tribal societies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sure enough, we've basically seen that. Right? Yeah. We've seen that the West has become so dominant that it's almost wiped out the condor. Yeah. And yet, at, there would be a point, and the, they projected about 1990, that the last cycle would end and the condor and eagle would have an opportunity to share the skies together and create a new way forward for humanity. Mm -hmm. Didn't say it was going to happen, so we had the opportunity. Yeah. But from my viewpoint, that seems to be exactly what's happening. Interesting. Is that now the, the, the indigenous ways are making their way out of the jungle. They're mm -hmm. making their way out of the villages in, in, in ancient, you know, Asian societies. Mm -hmm. And the yoga is coming to the West, right? Yeah. And Chinese medicine is now really flourishing. You know, yeah. acupuncture is becoming more of a thing. We have Ayurveda, which is seeing a resurgence. So mm -hmm. we're seeing sort of this, this, this thing happening. We and are. I think the feminine is coming back and we're coming, coming to a, a new way of operating that doesn't have to be so scientific and logical and left-brained, mm -hmm. that it can be, you know, experience-based, that it can be um, subjective, that yeah. it can be um, more heart-centered approaches. And so I, I love it, and it's, I think it's just going to continue this path because the, the other way just didn't seem to get us that far. You yeah. know, it was good, and I think there's a lot of good that came out of it. Sure. But it just seems to me that the, that the Western science is 
all it's doing is confirming what, what the Eastern sciences have been doing for thousands of years, mm -hmm. which is really funny. You know, it's just a matter of, of continuing that work and saying, oh yeah, I guess they're right. You know, yeah. turns out meditation's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, we had to do research to figure that out. <laughs> Absolutely, it's yeah. it's funny to me, but you know that's the way we are. And that's that's what we're that's the way we operate, and that's the way we think, and yeah. and it, it just validates it more and more. So, yeah. Yeah, you know. I was just thinking that was that was the exact term I was thinking. It validate our experiences, validate. You know, uh, you know, we could be doing one thing for two thousand years, and it could be working, but unless we prove it over and over again and, and document it, and well, uh, you our, know, our Western minds can't. Can't yeah, wrap, agree, can't wrap, I, I know. Good, you know? I know. But, but it's so funny because inherent in the research is the acknowledgement of the thing that we're denying. Right. And what I mean by that is every valid study involves, you know, uh, placebo controlled, yeah. double blind studies. Yeah. So what we're saying is is that the placebo is so powerful, we have to try to exclude it from our research yeah. because it will dominate and cloud the, the, the results. Yeah. So what we're saying is, is the mind itself. Yeah is so insanely powerful mm -hmm. that we can heal ourselves with our minds, so we got to exclude it. Yeah. And yet we're denying the very things that we're trying to exclude from the research because it's it's clouding the results. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just, it's sort of an ironic twist that, that we're validating the things that we already know are impacting yeah. um, our research. So, Did you hear, you were at the Pacific Symposium, we, we shared uh, that workshop, Paul Check's workshop Absolutely. together, which was Fantastic. completely awesome. Did you happen to catch Ted Kapchuk's uh, presentation on uh, penetrating the divine illumination? No, I he's, didn't. Uh, that sounds fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, he's talking about all the. Like, he's really he's a Harvard, you know, research professor. He's a Oriental medical doctor. He wrote the Web that has no Weaver, mm -hmm. one of the pioneers in Chinese medicine in the West. Anyway, so he was talking about a lot of this. What you were just um, speaking about about placebo and you know, I'm not going to get into. <laughs> penetrating the divine illumination. Well, but there's a lot of these, right? There's there's the Maharishi effect, right? right. Which is sort of this example exactly. of, of people meditating that impact the, the way that the world functions. We have heart math. Yep. Now, the, suggesting that humans perhaps are somewhat psychic mm -hmm. on a global level that we can sort of anticipate events and that, yeah. that, that heart coherence is involved with this stuff. Yeah. We, we have a lot of these examples. We have Lynn McTaggart looking at biophysics and this, in her book, The Power of Eight, which I love, which mm -hmm. is basically a group of eight, sort of seven or eight people that come together with the intention of healing the other yeah. and it turns out they all receive healing when we focus our attention on that so just with intention and meditation Absolutely. and focus mm -hmm. and our mind mm -hmm. we seem to be able to create amazing things yeah. so um, again I think it, we're just using the modern science to, to reiterate this fact and mm -hmm. I think so many people have had experiences uh, that we might call uh, divine or you know this sort of magical healing from God, I mean, whatever, you know, people want to term it Spontaneous as. healing, I yeah. think D Deepak Chopra wrote that book. Deepak sure, Deepak right, but we've got spontaneous healing. Yeah, and medical Qigong experts medical that can do amazing things. So so we're just kind of coming back around to this, and I think, it, it, unfortunately, it takes some experience um, somehow that you have to recognize it to be true. Mm -hmm. We can't always wait for research. Research is so limited due to funding and, yeah. and you know, the the incentive. You know, if there's no incentive to study something, why would somebody study it? Absolutely. Let alone dedicate millions of dollars to, to research this, which takes many, many years to come out, and there's all kinds of fraud in the scientific community, and that's just a part of the thing because there's money behind it. So, you know, I, th I think a lot of this has to do with um, bringing about some of these ancient ways, and I think it's trying to experience them yourself, mm -hmm. and seeing what's behind that, that curtain, and, and that's really the best thing to do. So where are you going with the, with the new project? What? What's your itinerary? The idea, hopefully, we'll see what comes out. Really, it's just about, at this point, trying to make connections and seeing what cultures end up emerging. But, mm -hmm. you know, the idea is to go into Peru, into the mountain, mountainous regions of Peru, mm -hmm. to work with the shamans in the mountainous regions, mm -hmm. uh, which they use plants, you know, San Pedro is a, is a plant medicine tool, and I think they do egg healing there. And then, and then also going into the jungle, where they use, you know, ayahuasca and mm -hmm. some of the other uh, tools in the jungle, which are different. Um, you know, so we want to explore that. We want to explore the North American natives mm -hmm. uh, with sweat lodges and, and, and these type of things. Um, you know, I think West Africa is interesting. They use a, a, the shamans there use a plant called iboga, yeah. which is a really powerful plant. And, and so we'll see if that comes about. But um, we definitely want to get into, you know, the areas of Tibet and, and India and China and some of those regions. So we'll see kind of what, what ends up coming out of this, but the, the idea is to get enough of a, a variety, um, and hopefully what I think we'll see is, is 
commonalities mm -hmm. in, in each of these traditions and the, the way that they think about about the human experience and, and healing the mind body spirit. Yeah. And so when it, before we uh, started recording, you and I were talking about the, the challenges of a making those connections mm -hmm. and then b you know um, responsibly exposing yeah. know, some of these more sensitive areas. So. Why don't, you, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's on your mind with, with respect to those, those uh, challenges? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it has to do with the consciousness of where we're at mm -hmm. in the West, right? Everything's a business, right? Everything is profit-driven. And that inherently is not a bad thing. But I think we have to balance that with the uh, respect for a lot of these cultures and traditions and locations and medicines, mm -hmm. right? Something that it, we're seeing, you know, emerge quite profoundly and, and, and abundantly right now is ayahuasca, right. right? This this plant medicine that's been used in, you know, traditionally Peru and in the Amazon jungle. Mm -hmm. um, it's a profound healing tool. I've had experience with myself. Um, I am a huge, huge proponent of using ayahuasca mm -hmm. in the traditional way. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that, yes, there are human components to the plant and the way we use it in ceremony and tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is sort of a human thing to it, you know, mm -hmm. which is to say that we may not necessarily have to take with us the human components if we want to continue this, this work with ayahuasca. But I think there is a, a way of using it that has been understood and respected in those communities. And so they, there is something to learn from them in that, in that aspect, mm -hmm. which is to say that we can't commercialize this thing. I don't think it's a good idea. I think there's a lot of downside to it. I think there's a lot of danger in it mm -hmm. um, because it does really, really take the person to a very, very intense level yeah. of healing. Um, and so you have to have practitioners or shamans or curanderos that mm -hmm. understand how to work with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I do, from my experience, there is a profound energetic aspect to this stuff that they work on another level that is not just in this physical reality. Yeah. So, you know, if we bastardize that and commercialize that, I think there's a lot of downside. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, of issues that we can create for ourselves. The other things like you know, um, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. meditation, breath work, mm -hmm. also amazing tools, mm -hmm. but we can also miss the point, right? And we see that in the West with yoga. It's a perfect yeah. example. We have hot yoga, we have yeah. goat yoga, we have, I mean, it's just getting ridiculous. Be beer yoga, that was my favorite one I saw I, in, in uh, the Bay Area. Know, was, they called it boga. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, this is the commercialization <laughs> of these traditional practices. Yeah. Now. I do inherently believe that it overall is a good thing. You know, any yoga that we're doing here is probably better than no yoga, so to speak. But I do think that we're, we can miss the point, mm -hmm. and it can get so skewed and so led down the wrong path that mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily what was intended, and we're not getting the the benefits that I think have been taught. So, yeah. this is the danger I think is that if we're pulling it into our sphere too quickly, yeah. then and their consciousness isn't there to accept it, yeah. then it just sort of gets you know, whitewashed and, and, and we, we use it in ways that, that really are not optimal. And mm -hmm. to use something like, I mean, imagine Chinese medicine if somebody's trying to use Chinese medicine or acupuncture. Mm -hmm. If somebody doesn't know acupuncture, they don't really know where to put, put the needles, they don't understand the points, yeah. and they're just putting needles in somebody. Oh, I'm doing acupuncture. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, no, you're not. And then somebody says, well, it doesn't work. It didn't work for me. Right. So we're missing, you know, that, that, that component. And, yeah. and I think, again, you, coming back to ayahuasca is another great example. I, I heard it's dangerous. I had a bad trip. Oh, there's, mm -hmm. there's, you know, sexual abuse happening, you know, and that's all due to commercialization. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think we just have to be careful. Well, or recre recreationalize. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Especially yeah. with something like with well, yeah, psilocybin is a good example. And it's a perfect example. And I think you know, I can, we can get to a lot of levels of, of how that's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, ultimately, you know, I don't. I don't have a pessimistic view on any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's going to come out. I think it's coming out. I think yeah. it's going to continue to come out. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all good. Yeah. Um, I just think that if we want to play this game, um, in my view, it's all it's all going in a direction, and it's just a matter of how much how much suffering we want to <laughs> we want to endure in the process. Do we yeah. want to you know do we want to take on these these modalities and these healing tools yeah. uh, with an adult uh, mindset with a somebody who is. Uh, responsible, somebody who is um, respectful mm -hmm. uh, and mature, or do we want to take them on like, like kids or like teenagers and yeah. just throw these things around and see what happens? And we can do both, you know, it's just a matter of, of really where we want to go with this stuff. So I think this is this is sort of the, the conscious co-creation that we have and yeah. what role do we want to play. And my job, I see, is to help coax this into the mature 
mm -hmm. uh, conscious arena and mm -hmm. not not leave it to this sort of childlike uh, wonder and, and playing around with the stuff foolishly. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, we can we can have a positive impact on the consciousness of these things, mm -hmm. and we can use them in a way that is very successful. Because I think there can be, um, uh, you know, we can capitalize on this from a, a economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, we can commercialize this stuff in a responsible way. We just yeah. we just have to make sure we're not bastardizing it. Are there certain areas that you don't know what you're going to find? It sounds like you're, you're, you're pretty well educated on certain areas. You, you can know the tools of the trade that, you know, yeah. down south you're going to get the ayahuasca, you're going to get some some plant-based medicine, you know, there's going to be some dance in Africa, sure. some medicine, yeah, yeah. some acupuncture. Is there some place you're not quite sure what you're going to get? I actually think there's going to be, um, in every place I think, there's going to be stuff that we don't know, okay. that I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm familiar enough, but I think there are so many tools that they use. Yeah. And the way that they use it, I think it's going to be so interesting and so fascinating. I mean, if you ask like a shaman in uh, in the in the jungle, um, yeah. you know, how did you, where did ayahuasca come from? How did you learn? And yeah. they said, well, the plants taught us. Yeah. So it's like that's a discussion point that can be really opened up, yeah. right? I don't even have a clue what he's really going to say and how yeah. how, it, how it came about. Same thing with acupuncture or Chinese medicine and yeah. breath work. Like, how the heck did you guys? Where did this come from? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know it's taught through a lineage and it's been around for a while, but. We, where did this come from? We get that question all the time with you know, acupuncture because it's millennial. Well, it's right. like, well, on the battlefield, the warriors were hit here, and all of a sudden their headache went away there, and right. as it, or you know the, you know the, the sage meditated for twenty four hours straight and envisioned the whole, the whole meridian system. It's like absolutely. I mean, so I think there's, a, there's some really cool stories, and again, we don't even get lost in the stories, right? Because yeah. it's it's neither here nor there. If something works, it works. That's really all that matters, right? Yeah. Um, but I think there's some fun stories that to, to uncover. Yeah. Um, and then there's some, I, I, undoubtedly, there's going to be some stuff that I have no idea what's underneath mm -hmm. the, the culture. I mean, egg healing is a perfect example. I, so, I, so what is egg healing? I'm not familiar with And I don't even really know. I actually bought a book on it so I could figure out what the heck it is. Where is it from? Um, it, it, I believe it originated in, in some of the, the tribes in South America, okay. in the, in the uh, jungle. Okay. And I think... I think don't don't quote me because I am very ignorant. Well, you're on air. On air. Right? Everyone's <laughs> recording this. <laughs> I believe they take an egg okay. and they rub it all over your body. And okay. they just they just kind of an egg in a shell, right? So imagine a shell, a shell, raw, real on egg. Your skin. Yep. And they just kind of rub it around your field, your energetic field. Okay. And then they crack the egg, and somehow they're able to read the egg, yeah. and Interesting. that picked up some some aspect of your energetic template that you're working with that they're able to, to figure out and then I think from there they can prescribe different modalities whether it's herbs or teas or what have you mm -hmm. I don't know so um, for you at home do not try this at home <laughs> <laughs> I mean but let's there's an, there's a way I can imagine that this works right we know that that water holds memory it right. holds information we know this right I mean Gerald Pollock's work has shown us this um, to you know, yeah exactly um, and, and many others yeah. right so so this this is a reality that we are starting to understand. Um, so, could it be that your energetic field, which getting into Chinese medicine and acupuncture, we we know that this has been this is practice, right? This mm -hmm. this way of reading the field of somebody, and that each organ and system has its own sort of unique signature of energies. Mm -hmm. um, could it be that that in the egg, which is a gelatinous, um, structured water type of of substance, mm -hmm. um, could it be that information is being stored in, in, in the field of that egg and, and then read somehow, right? I mean, I don't know. It's amazing. But, but again, um, there's books on this stuff. You can go Google this on the internet and learn about it. There's people practicing this. This is exactly the type of stuff that I want to uncover and say, hey, yeah. what the heck is this? How, yeah. how did somebody think to do this, yeah. right? And what are you reading and how does it work? And, and again, they may not use scientific language to explain this stuff, mm -hmm. but that's okay. If I can, if I can pull forth the essence of what they're saying, yeah. then I think there's a lot to learn, mm -hmm. and we can sort of translate that with our English language and our, our scientific language, and maybe try to try to pull that out. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's always a challenge for me as a practitioner is translating biomedicine into yes. traditional. You know, it's it's incumbent upon the practitioner that's practicing the traditional medicine to be bilingual because Western. Scientific-minded practitioners, they don't want to be bilingual, right. but they they recognize at least now that something is going on. Right. You know, if your patients are getting better by egg healing, great. 
Well, and, and let's look at the, the chakra system, right? This is this yeah. is something you, I generally found that people either believe in the chakra system or they don't. Yeah. Um, there's very few people in between. Um, but you know, if you look at the research on the research, the the, the wisdom of the chakras, they have they each have their own uh, function. They each have their own color associated, and they each have their own frequency and many other things. Sure. But let's stick to frequency and color. There's lots of people out there now practicing with tuning forks mm -hmm. and uh, you know all kinds of musical instruments. Yeah to uh, balance or harmonize or bring back into resonance mm -hmm. these chakra systems. Um, that may sound ridiculous to some people, yeah. but we also know that, that cell function is, has resonant frequencies and that, that you can actually kill organisms with certain other frequencies. Mm -hmm. So we can bring cells back into resonance just by using sound. Yeah. And, and this infrasound is, is being used right now in biomedical sciences and in biophysics. So, Again, you know, drumming and these tuning forks and you know, sound bowls and singing bowls, you know, that they use in Tibet. I mean, again, this stuff is people aren't stupid. You yeah. know, th these were not primitive people. They're very, very intelligent, oh, yeah. and they have tons of wisdom, and it's been carried on for thousands of years. So we have to at least suspect, mm -hmm. you know, starting off with a scientific hypothesis that, that something is going on there, yeah. and how can we understand it, right? So. So using color and sound, I think, is a, a very interesting way to think about how the body works. And there's no reason to think that that wouldn't work, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason to think. Knowing what quantum physics is looking at right now in yeah. terms of, of everything being sort of energetic waves yeah. um, and, and operating with spin and movement, um, why wouldn't we think that, that you know, wavelengths of light and wavelengths of sound mm -hmm. can impact our biology? It yeah. seems completely reasonable to me. And uh, this is what many, many universities and, and research departments around the world are looking at, mm -hmm. particularly in, in places like Russia and China. They're looking at all this frequency medicine, right? Yeah. So um, pretty, pretty reasonable to start there. We just have to understand it. Yeah. So, so you're going to start off, you, you were telling me, in February, March? Yeah, hopefully, we, hopefully we're going to start here pretty soon. I mm -hmm. think um, some of this is weather dependent, right? Sure. So if we're going to go out oh, to, yeah. to the Amazon, like there's a sort of a wet period and a dry period, so right. we've got to kind of go in, 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 in the dry period there. So, yeah, I mean, this is the funny thing. I mean, um, to be honest, um, and I actually credit some of my experience with ayahuasca that wow. had given me the outlook of, of just going with the flow. Yeah. Uh, it was the first time that I recognized that I, I can't control life. Yeah. Uh, it sounds so, sort of obvious, but really operating in the flow of life and yeah. letting things come to me as uh -huh. opposed to trying to track things down and make things happen. So I was very type A mm -hmm. and a really profound ayahuasca experience helped me understand that, um, that to, to operate with the, the flow mm -hmm. of life and really with, at ease. And so this is, this is how we approached our last documentary film series. We were scheduled to go to Okinawa mm -hmm. and in two weeks we had everything booked. We had our flights booked and we were ready to go, but we were two weeks out and we didn't have a translator. Uh -huh. We didn't have a way to get around the island because you can't rent a car. Uh -huh. uh, it's much more difficult there to rent a car. So we didn't have a place, we didn't have, we didn't have 100 year olds to talk to, we didn't have a translator, and we didn't have a way around the island. So, you know, we weren't stressed out. We actually ended up uh, emailing a yoga studio that had English, an English website uh -huh. and said, hey, you know, can you connect us with anybody? Are there any you know? <laughs> and they connected us with sort of liaison uh -huh. that ended up picking up, hit up picking us up in his car, oh, his cool. Admiral Maserati, mm -hmm. and drove us around the island and introduced us to 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, 100-year-olds. Oh, yeah. And that's, I mean, it worked, right? So, so there were some lucky, lucky breaks, let's mm -hmm. just say, in, in our process of, of filming the last docuseries, that this is how we're approaching this one. So to some degree, it's, it's mapped out, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of quasi-planned, yeah. but really it's a matter of the connections that we make and, and who comes forth and, and how we can approach that. And so it's... Really, we kind of just fly by the seat of our plants and go with the flow, uh -huh. and I am so confident that it'll work out. That we'll that we'll meet the people that we need to meet. We will bring forth the cultures that we need to bring forth, yeah. and it'll all it'll all flow just like it's supposed to. Nice. You know, it takes we have to show up. You know, don't oh, get me wrong. Sure. We're gonna sit yeah. back, but yeah. it's also not like we have to control this thing and plan it out to yeah. the T for it to, to be successful. And how long how long is this journey to take you? A year I, or yeah, so, I would or? suspect, yeah, probably a year, you know, yeah. um, the last one took us about a year and a half, mm -hmm. um, but we did, I mean, we did over 120 interviews, so that was, wow. you know, including the experts, so the travel yeah. itself was probably only a six-month uh -huh. venture, and the rest was trying to get the, the local professionals, you know, yeah. the doctors and the experts, so um, we're, we're not going to have as many this time, mm -hmm. uh, I, ten days in each area, you know, seven, eight areas, mm -hmm. so it's really only, you know, three months of filming, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in that regard, so... 
yeah, we'll see. I think I think it'll take probably a year to execute, given the fact that we have other things going on as well. Yeah, and so editing time included in that. Yeah, so yeah. final final project. Yeah, you thinking uh, about hopefully a year? hopefully in twenty twenty we'll have something ready to, to be released. Um, uh, yeah, we'll see. We can't wait for the uh, the film opening. I'm where, excited. Where are you gonna, how, how's that going to be? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we will uh, probably distribute it online on our website, okay. um, yeah, and so we'll keep people uh, posted uh, as it develops. But, but yeah, we, we have the Human Longevity Project that we're, we're relaunching again here in, in May of next okay. year. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have more people um, engage with that. And that's, and that's a free event, so mm -hmm. we're going to be launching that. You can watch that for free, all nine parts, nice. in, in early May. So, oh, super. Yeah, so people can go to humanlongevityfilm.com and, and just sign up for notifications, and we'll let you know when that's, that's showing again. Yeah, that, that, that's a really important series to watch, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I want to watch the whole thing. I'd watch the part of it. it. You, don't have to watch, you don't have to sit down and watch it like the Mahabharata or something. <laughs> you know. But uh, so any, anything uh, left sort of, um, I mean, I know you completed the Human Longevity Project. Anything sort of, are there any stones left unturned from that? And going backwards to the yeah, old, I mean, old project. Yeah, I think there's so much, right? I mean, really what we tried to do is, is focus on the areas that, that we thought could be the biggest levers, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, things like circadian rhythm, things like childbirthing and rearing, mm -hmm. things like the environment, um, you know, and then some of the biological aspects like the microbiome and mm -hmm. the microbiota and, and the immune system and mitochondria and how all that works together. Uh, and then, you know, the lifestyle factors. So um, there's, there's probably a lot left unsaid, but I think at the end of the day, the, the big message that we tried to confer was that health is an innate given. Yeah. Your body knows how to be healthy. It was designed to be healthy. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to take health back into our own hands. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, it's really a matter of, of getting back to the simple life. Mm -hmm. Simplifying everything. The more we try to overcomplicate it, mm -hmm. the more we're likely to get into trouble. Um, and if we can just simplify our thoughts, simplify our emotions, mm -hmm. simplify our actions, our behavior, our food, our everything, mm -hmm. right? Our whole lifestyle, your calendar, your closet, mm -hmm. you know, the, your shampoo, you know, everything, just simplify it. And use less, do less. Um, that really seems to be. Um, the balancing point, right? It's not a matter of not doing things. It's just we're overdoing everything right now, yeah. you know. And except for moving, it's probably the thing that we're not we're not doing. Yeah. Uh, but but actually, one guy um, in his, I think it was in Greece. Maybe he was a ninety nine year old. He said, uh -huh. you know, when I was young, the the body was busy and the mind was still. Now the body was busy and the mind was still. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah. the problem is that the, the mind, mind is busy, busy and the body is still. Yeah. And I thought that's the perfect summary of, of the problems that we see in the West. We are overthinking, we are, you know, our systems are just stressed to the hilt, but our yeah. bodies are not moving enough. Yeah. And so, so to some degree, it's just, it's slowing that mind down, moving a little bit more, simplifying life, and, and that's it. So I have, a, I have a little story to share with you. In my neighborhood, there, there used to be a, a guy, he was over 100, driving his car around. He's no longer alive, but... Uh, he used to drive around with his wife, who was somewhere right around 100, and his name was Fred, anyway. So I ran into Fred one day, and I said, I knew, because I knew he was over 100, mm -hmm. and I said, Fred, what's the, what's the answer to longevity? And he said, beautiful women and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I can't and, argue. But, and, I said, and I knew this about him. He used to work for Folgers, though, <laughs> so I get the coffee part. Well, and, and what's funny and, is and that... The beautiful women part. It, well, it's funny when you talk to somebody that's 100 years old. Their life is so simple, yeah. right? So this is we have to we have to take the historical context of things, right? Yeah. When you talk to somebody that's 95 years old that lives in Ikaria, Greece, yeah. you know they, they were born in 1923. Right. So most of they didn't get electricity in Ikaria, Greece till like 1960 or 70. So, so we, no so TV, then, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> God forbid, right? But they lived like 50, 50 years of their life with no yeah. refrigeration. No, no overhead lighting, yeah. right? Think of all the things that we do with electricity, transportation of food. Yeah. So 50 years with none of that stuff. Water, fresh food, water's fresh different. Like yeah. everything's different. Yeah. So, you know, when they, when you ask them the secret to long life and to health, they're going to give you a radically different answer mm -hmm. than than maybe what is needed. Mm -hmm. Which is to say that the way that we're living is very, very different now. So, 
Uh, we have to remember that. There's a historical context to anybody Absolutely. that's 100 years old, yeah. especially in these, in these remote parts of the world, you know, those mountains of Sardinia. You know, very, very different um, lifestyle growing up. And, and you can even see this with the food. You know, a lot of them said that bread was different back then, that their mm -hmm. bread was so healthy and it was a part of every, every meal. Well, they, they baked it themselves. But they not only baked it, they, yeah. they took a donkey and would grind the, right. the, the traditional grains, right. and they would grind them. And then they would make make them make them themselves. They would you know, so everything was different. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them would say that, that they can't find like bread like that anymore. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, meat. Some people wouldn't even eat meat anymore because of the way it's being you know raised. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about in remote parts of the world, not yeah. not factory farming like we do here. I mean, they're they're eating meat that's much better than what we have, but yet yeah. it's not as it's not cared for nearly as much. The, mm -hmm. the food is different, right? So. You know, everything's changed. And so we, we can't simply look at their life and say, okay, what did you do? Mm -hmm. Because we can't do that anymore. Right. Sorry, you're never going to live like somebody that lived in 1948 yeah. in Korea. Yeah. Right? It's sort of it, what you're saying, it, it's resonating with me. I'm thinking about certain fad diets that are oh, gosh, e yeah. existent right now. And, you know, people are claiming that this diet, I'm not going to mention any diets because, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. You offend everybody. It's really what happens. It, it, it's trust me. Yeah. That's what we did. We basically offend <laughs> everybody. Yeah. Because what we said is that that's, it's not a diet. Yeah. It's, it's, you have to balance this out. It depends on your state. It depends on your age. It depends on all these things. But Where the fundamental live. characteristic, is it real food? Yeah. Is it grown in good soil? Yeah. Is it hopefully local? Mm -hmm. And is it maybe even seasonal? Yeah. Uh, that seems to be the main factor. It's not the other stuff, you yeah. know, because you can be vegan and eat the worst diet ever. You can sure. be paleo and eat a crappy diet. Right. You can eat, you know, there's any number of diets mm -hmm. that, that can be completely poor as a general concept, but also particularly poor for you. Right. Right. And, yeah. and, and Paul Check mentioned this in, in his uh, lecture, actually, right. at, the, at the symposium, mm -hmm. um, that, and I forget, I'm forgetting his name, but the researcher in the early 1900s who basically would take cadavers and measure the length, oh, right, right? The from, yeah, yeah, from mouth to no. anus, right, right. right? And, and he discovered a 100% difference in length. Some right. people had like 21 foot length and some people yeah, would have 42. That was fascinating. So that's to, that right there suggests that, you know, some people would be able to handle more plant foods and grains and tougher, you know, foods to break down and some people might do better on, on more of an animal product diet. Mm -hmm. Um, as even a starting point, let alone no matter what age they are, right. because that's going to determine these these things, right. and their local environment is also going to determine things, right. right? So, you know, eating tons of fruit like they do in Costa Rica may not be very good for somebody who lives in in Iceland or, or Ireland, right? Right. Um, or, or you know, the Inuits that eat mostly you know traditional whale whale meat or, right. or coal foods. If well, you put it, plant based diet in exactly their culture, and, and let alone yeah. yeah, thinking about the sort of paleo style, right? I mean. Yeah. It, it, and Inuits are one of my favorite examples because a lot of them would actually eat the intestinal mm -hmm. contents mm -hmm. of some of the animals. Like, who, who do you know is eating intestinal contents of animals these days, right? Um, who, who do you know is foraging for all their, their food, you know, and, and picking these leaves and roots and berries and flowers and all these things, you know? Yeah. Not many people I know are eating that way. So yeah. to say that we should be eating like somebody who did 10,000 years ago is sort of silly. Yeah. The, the general concept is a good one, but it's, it's not realistic. So... We've got to forget a lot of those diets and, and go yeah. back to a more just simplified version of everything, mm -hmm. and one that agrees with our system. Yeah. And it could very well change uh, over time, depending on the de disease state that we're in mm -hmm. and depending on our age, right? Yeah. And, and I think the thing that we describe in the film is that forgetting even that what you eat, what you're eating, it's a matter of when you're eating mm -hmm. a lot of times. And this goes back to a lot of Ayurvedic principles. I don't know about Chinese medicine. If they get into this, they oh, probably see. do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, very, um, very deeply. Exactly. So, so, so the timing of foods is very critical. Yeah, uh, everything about your food. I mean, Chinese medicine says you eat regular meals at regular times, but beyond that, the way in which you eat is more important than uh, what you're yeah, eating. Absolutely. You know, so get, if, you're, you know, yeah. if you and I are sitting down enjoying a meal together and we're good friends, that's a lot different than if we're sitting down and we or we're standing and we're agitated. Right, or you're right? eating in the car. Or you're eating yeah. in the car. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, and, and then huh. we get into this exact thing in, in I think it's episode three of our, of our series, because yeah. it's important, right? Um, and, and what you notice with a lot of these cultures that we visited is that they would either offer thanks mm -hmm. before they ate, or they would pray, or they would say something, yeah. right? And so it's basically even forgetting more esoteric 
analysis of that. Mm -hmm. At the very least, it's putting them in a parasympathetic state, yeah. right? Being in a state of gratitude. And, Being in gratitude. Right? <laughs> and so, yeah. so there's a lot of ways we can physiologically explain, explain yeah. this stuff, and I totally agree that the, 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 the context in which you eat may be the most important mm -hmm. over what you're eating. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, there's a lot to, to think that that's the case. Yeah. Even modern research, which shows that you can eat McDonald's, and if you're on a beach with friends and in a happy, calm state, yeah. it digests much differently than if you're eating uh, McDonald's in, in a car, stressed yeah. out, on the phone, while yeah. driving, right? With your knee. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, there's just so much nuance to it that it's, you can get lost really easy. So to dumb it down and say you should follow this diet or that diet, I think, is, yeah. is, is overwhelmingly simplistic. Well, it just shows people are looking for answers, I think, which is, that's a good thing, you know. Right. They're, they're looking for ways to improve, and oftentimes they're just getting misinformation. So that's why it's so important that yeah. we have, you know, health educators or, or life educators or coaches, you know, right. whatever we want to call ourselves or whatever you want to call yourself. That's why this work is so important. And I, and I really appreciate um, the work you're doing right now, and I know that, you know, this next, I'm really looking forward to this next me too. I'm project. excited to get yeah. going on because it's been yeah. brewing in, in sort of my mind for all, yeah. all, actually over a year now. Um, I was really excited to, to do this type of thing. And who, who's on your team right now? The same production team that did the Yeah, yeah. We have um, our filmmaker is, is John Dahlgren. He's sort of the creative uh, visionary of, mm -hmm. of a lot of the, the production work. Um, him and Joe uh, Rignola as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have an, a really good editor, um, Mike, Mike Skokoff, and he's. Um, He's fantastic in terms of what he can see on the back end and uh -huh. how to put this together. So, yeah, we've got a very small crew, um, but but we, we're all sort of familiar with this type of content, and um, and it just seems to work really, really well. Yeah, exciting. Yeah. Well, Jason, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I know our listeners are going to be uh, really happy to, to check out the, the longevity uh, Human Longevity Project. And uh, hopefully the next one, name unknown. Yeah, we're gonna find some good coming soon. <laughs> and uh, we just are so appreciative of you coming down today and sharing your your experience yeah, with us. Absolutely, yeah. thank you so much. I mean, our our, our values and our, our the way that we approach this stuff um, is so aligned. That yeah. it's it's an easy conversation. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll see more of you around here. I'm sure. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, buddy.